Doing leather work has always, it's just kind of therapeutic in a way. Always just kind of drawn to things made out of leather because leather, the way it smells, the way it feels, there's nothing like it. It was an easy thing for me to get involved in, and it was just kind of like a family trade at the same time. And in certain aspects, it wasn't like I apprenticed under my parents, I apprenticed under my uncle, but it just went from there. I've always loved leather. I mean, when I was a little kid, I begged my mom for a leather jacket. She got me one. Of course, I had to use my allowance to get it, but always just kind of drawn to things made out of leather. I'm Rich uh, with Rich Phillips Leather and I do motorcycle seats, mainly. Uh, I do belts as well as wallets, but specializing in uh, fabricating and altering any make, model. We, uh, we could do seats from the ground up, seat pans, the whole deal. We run the gamut when it comes to the seating setup on your motorcycle. So when I was a little kid, my mom, she would always tool leather. She had all these tools sitting around. She made purses. Um, so I was kind of introduced to it at a young age. She's, she'd always been sewing and tooling. So, uh, But my uncle had an upholstery shop, and he asked me to come right along and go and do semi-truck upholstery when I was probably 14 or so. And I, at the time, I would work with him a couple days a week. He would he'd work until like three, four in the morning. He'd typically he'd bring me home at about 12 because my parents would be like, you need to bring our teenage kid back. <laughs> but that's kind of where it started. I started working for him and it's kind of just been a lifelong career. I've had a few other jobs here and there, but that's been it. I started getting interested in motorcycles, you know, probably 21, 22 or so. And I got um, a Sportster, of course, that's what everybody seems to start out on. And then I built a, a chopper. I bought like a kit. Um, it had like a big 100 inch RevTech motor in it. And I started making seats for both of those bikes. And a local chop chopper builder here in St. Charles saw some of the work I had done on bikes I had sold. So he asked me to start doing some of his seats. And then it, I, I realized there that there was a kind of a niche for this. Right away, a lot of the guys that I work with at Road Motorcycles were bringing me stuff. And of course, I wasn't getting paid like what the jobs were worth at the time, but I was also just kind of coming into it. So from there, a lot of people were just starting to bring me motorcycle seats and it kind of snowballed. And I took some seats off of bikes that I had and I started putting them on eBay and they were selling for real money. So that's kind of where it started. My uncle, my dad's brother, he always had, he had a Sportster. As soon as he got out of the Navy, he bought a, a Sportster in the Navy. Um, right away, I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen when I was a kid. He lived uh, there with us um, growing up in uh, Ferguson. And then he got a panhead chopper like with crazy flames all over it. And my uncle was kind of living the lifestyle. He was not just uh, into it for a hobby. He looked like he should be riding a panhead chopper and all that goes along with that. So he definitely developed a love in from me towards motorcycling and choppers as well. And that just kind of, it, it sprung an interest and it wasn't something I could shake. Last year, I went to the Born Free show in Texas, and I hadn't been doing anything in the motorcycle industry other than just making seats for quite a while. And after 
attending that, I was inspired. I saw like just the uh, talent and the craftsmanship there and um, kind of my departure from the mainstream or like the uh, forefront of the business, being back in it, it inspired me. But I kind of decided I wanted to do something different than the, just main, just the regular chopper, the type of motorcycle that everybody else had been doing. I love those motorcycles and I may do another one. I've done them in the past. I've owned pan heads and knuckle heads and all that, but never did anything too wild with them. So FXRs are definitely a, um, a lure these days, but it seems that everybody just, it seems like it's kind of like gone and fallen into like a, um, a niche, if you will, or like a, a rut of just doing kind of performance oriented stuff. And I love all that stuff. Uh, I love performance motorcycles. I've, uh, I have no, no issue with that. I'm definitely not bad mouthing that. But I wanted to kind of combine the folk art type chopper look into an FXR. A motorcycle that kind of resembles something that might have been able to be done in the 60s or 70s with just basic tools. Everything was cut by hand on a bandsaw. Sometimes I would use like a uh, plasma cutter, but it's hand tools. Welder, mill, lathe, tubing benders, and you know. I love bare metals just because they tend to, like paint seems temporary. I always have a t uh, problem of knocking paint off of bikes. <laughs> so like by either dropping them or somebody will hit it with a board or you know something like that. Bare metals, they do require some maintenance, but if you keep up with the maintenance, it's, it's something that can last forever. But I always have loved the, the Japanese builders, like um, the high day, uh, his, some of the motorcycles that he's built are just on a different level, as well as Craig Rod Smith, close to Chicago, is, just does a lot of bare metal bikes. Um, Shinya, Kamura, uh, the stuff is just on another level. And I, lo I love how Shinya's bikes, they're so much different than anything else. And I love that he just does it. He lets it, he does it in a pure, raw fashion. He doesn't worry about like there, there's guys in the industry that will look at your stuff and they have to find something wrong with it. But he, does it, he doesn't get hung up on that. He does it in the way that he wants, regardless of what other people think. And that's just kind of what I wanted to do with this, you know? I mean, there's little, you can see grind marks and scratch marks and little areas where I didn't smooth the metal out perfect. And I did my best to do, you know, get as perfect as I could. But at a point I was like, I can't, I want to get past this, so I'm just going to, it's going to be what it's going to be. And I got to a point where I was satisfied with it and just kind of left it at that. And maybe the next one I'll get better. <laughs> The concept for the tank, it's really hard to get a tank that's like, that's kind of different and doesn't look like everything else, but still has like its roots in like a traditional look. So I started just playing with uh, Procreate on an iPad, just drawing stuff in. And I did a lot of that. I just took a photo of the bike and then would um, make the photo kind of disappear a little bit or make the photo like a little more transparent and then draw on top of it to kind of get a a concept for how I wanted the lines to flow. So after I kind of got a concept, I decided I wanted that tank, like the front of the tank to um, follow the uh, down tubes to have that same angle right there. So I just made a paper template initially and made the two sides, just the, the outer shells. 
and got those to kind of where I wanted them. And then I laid them out on the um, fab table and just started like taking tape and trying to clamp them, which was not the easiest task, to where I thought the tank looked proportioned to the bike. Um, and just kind of did it intuitively and then built the, the middle panel to weld, weld the two together. And then the fender, for me, the fender on all motorcycles are the, the back tail piece. I, I probably spend more time in that detail than I even do on the tank on everything that I've built. Um, or at least the last few builds, I should say. But I wanted it to have like that flip up in the back. And I, that was the third attempt. Uh, I got two other pieces that wound up in the trash. But I made the, the main skeleton out of three sixteenths aluminum out of various different sheets. And being a pattern maker by trade, it was you know easy to get that part and then initially i made it tried to make it two halves like the skin that that um uh bridged the uh skeleton and it just didn't work the the weld line down the middle started to ripple so cut it all back out and started over and made it out of one and i wanted to have that really harsh flip up up to the uh that lip and then the um the sissy bar i just kind of I'm inspired by like Jeff Wright's stuff. I always like what he does. Um, I do seats for him here and there too. Uh, so I kind of implemented some of his ideas into the bike. And for the taillight, I wanted something that was bright enough to actually work. So that taillight is actually the uh, one half of a road glide little Harley assembly that I took and chopped it all up and and machined it to have a little bolt hole to hold it in there. But it's a Kuriakin actual uh, uh, light element, so it's plenty bright. Hey guys, want to take a second to talk about Get Lower Cycles. Get Lower Cycles is in Warminster, Pennsylvania. They have their own shop there where they do fab work, installs, motor work, dyno tunes. They're also a huge source for performance Harley parts. They've got a great site set up. They carry suspension, brakes, seats, whatever you need from the best brands out there. Not only is Get Lower coming on board to help me bring more of this interview series to you, they're also going to make it easier for you to find any of the parts that we've just discussed. So for each build, Get Lower is going to create a link that I'll drop in the description that has all the parts laid out that we just discussed. So say you're interested in running a suspension setup we just went through, or you just have the typical what fairing and bars question is that. All you got to do is click on that link below and they'll have everything laid out for you. Simple and easy. Make sure you check these guys out. If you like watching these series, make sure you use those links to order parts. Supporting them helps them support me so I can bring more of this to you. Let's get back to it. So the idea for the skid plate was kind of the, those electronics down there and uh, the motor mount aren't the most attractive thing in the world. So the skid plate was designed to cover up that stuff. Uh, but I mean, it does serve as a skid plate too. If I were to, you know, go do some back roads, a rock flying through the engine case, you know, might not be such a worry. But then the, the side covers, I thought about going a much more complicated route with that and integrate the side covers there, right there into the rear fender, but thought better of it later and just made those. What's funny is everybody talks about those and they look good, but that was one of the easiest parts on that bike to make. Uh, but sometimes that's that's the way it goes. The easy stuff is the stuff that catches people's eye. And then the uh, the front brace on the fork, um, I wanted it. I wanted to kind of brace it up. I don't know if it's the most effective brace in the world, but it's also kind of a, uh, a it's an appointment back on the bike to kind of draw your eye in too to the fork because the whole rest of the bike was so flashy that the fork needed something and it needed some kind of. Uh, bling or you know something on it so I came up with those little covers that cover up the stanchions a little bit like a um, flat track bike and just made that all out of aluminum multiple attempts and patterns and finally got it dialed um, but yeah it all in all I think it's weird when you when you make one part of a bike look too fancy and the rest of it kind of starts to look plain you, it needs some addressing you can't just like leave it at that you know but there was lots of parts that wound up in the trash. <laughs> the 
light on this bike or the lights uh, on the front there are from Diode Dynamics and they're actually a local company here to St. Charles, Missouri. They do lots of off-road lights and all that kind of thing. Those lights are insanely bright, but I felt like the lights alone weren't enough. They needed like a little bit more adornment. So I made those pieces to kind of, or that piece to go around it and also serves as a dash for the speedometer, the little Moto Gadget speedometer. And the, the handlebars are all stainless. I used like Bung King um, handlebar bungs, uh, stainless bungs, and then just bent the bars on a tubing bender back there. Bending handlebars, it's another one of those things. Everybody thinks it's so easy, but it's very difficult to get a, a handlebar symmetrical, like to get all the bends in the right place and get it clocked in the right spot on the bender to have the bends be perfectly, be in perfect symmetry. Stainless has a tendency to like bounce back more than uh, regular DOM steel, but got it pretty good. It's, you know, like all things, it could be a little bit better. I kind of wish I got a little more sweep, like just a few maybe more degrees sweep, but it's good. I'm, I was happy that they turned out the way they did for the first attempt uh, for once on the, on the bike. <laughs> the hand controls are all um, custom tech, I think. They're out of Italy. And I had some of the hand controls left over from a knucklehead build I did uh, that I sold the knucklehead to Kenny Slaughter. And then he gave me the hand controls back because I guess they were a little, weren't his taste. So those hand controls are actually, they're, they're fairly expensive. Um, so I just kind of liked the look of those, that retro look of those type of hand controls. And uh, the levers are like solid brass and just kind of their cast um, old world look to them. So I felt that it fit the bike fairly well. And th then after getting it done, I was like, man, I should have just done all aluminum, but it's good. <laughs> and the uh, axle adjusters on the rear are from Fabricator Kevin. And it's just like you take the factory swing arm off, cut it in a certain spot, and then I TIG welded those back on. And then I used bare knuckle choppers uh, uh, axles, as well as bare knuckle like hardware for the shocks. They're the 12 point ARP um, bolts that they make like custom machined in their shop, as well as like swapping out as many bolts that I reasonably could with ARP um, bolts as well. And just try to get rid of all the factory, ugly, corroded bolts with stainless. The motor, when I bought the bike, already had the SNS parts on it. It had SNS heads and a mild cam. It's not been bored or anything. It's still just an 80 cubic inch. It's nothing crazy. I have a tendency to lean more towards aesthetics than even when I'm building something from the ground up, especially something like this is going to be more of a, a promotional piece. The performance might not even get used that much uh, because if I'm going to go for a long ride, I'm going to go on my, my road glide. Uh, but honestly, the thing performs great. It, it really does pull pretty hard and in traffic, the thing's just constantly like lunging forward just a little bit, just with the, the, uh, the cam that's in there, you know? Um, and then the pipe, you know, I made the pipe from scratch, all stainless. And, uh, the muffler is just like some no name piece that had just a strange look to it. So I didn't want to just use, I was looking for parts that you don't typically see on things. And that muffler is like a hundred bucks. It's not, not anything special. It was like a hundred bucks and, um, it's all stainless, but it was, uh, they, they do some kind of chemical polishing. It took forever to kind of grind or like sand that away to where I could get an actual polish on it and then polish the pipe all up. I made the seat from the ground up. I made that little piece on the back there that, that uh, kind of puts the seat a little farther forward. And the seat itself is just, it has uh, a tab that goes under the tank and a little Velcro piece that holds the whole thing on and it's, Perfect, so.
if you're if you're interested in getting um, anything done by me, getting a seat uh, built or getting something kind of that nobody else has on your motorcycle, please get in touch with me at richphillipscycles.com and uh, or you can text my numbers out on the website 314-392-7841 and I really appreciate you taking the time to check the bike out and hope you enjoyed this. Thank <laughs> you.